Well, thank you so much for inviting me to present my current research. I'm really excited to be here today. I look forward for comments, thoughts after the third presentation, of course. Uh, my name, by the way, is uh, both the name and the accent are from Israel. So get used to it, for at least for the next 15 minutes. Um, let me tell you what I want to do. I want to do a very short introduction to private equity, just uh, really general to put everyone on the same page. Then I want to talk about a new project that I have about <coughs> tax avoidness at PE portfolio firms level. If PE firms, private firms that are owned by private equity sponsors avoid more taxes than similar other firms. And then I want uh, to focus mainly on managerial incentive in financial reporting. I want to talk about managerial incentive when companies going private. If it's management bar transaction when the management team take the company private or leverage bar transaction when KKR, Ben Capital, color, color group of the world take the company private. And then I want to talk about the reverse. I don't think I have time, but the reverse talking about going public transaction. If a private equity take a company private and public again, it's reverse LBO. And then we can talk about the Blackstone groups going to IPO of a private equity itself. So let's talk about a small private equity, KKR for example. They raise a lot of money, institutional invest investors, endowments, etc. They create a, a fund and they start to identify targets. Let's assume that they identify the target firm. Then they usually used to raise a lot of money from the banks, from the public, <coughs> about 60 to 90 percent. And then they buy the company, hold it for seven, ten years, hopefully sell it for a profit via IPO or via selling to another uh, strategic or private equity buyer. 70 percent of the profits going back to the institutional investors. 20 percent of the profits that called carried interest go back to KKR. The balance of 10 percent going typically to the management team, and this will be my focus of the second part of the presentation. Uh, and we're talking about a lot of money here. If you look at Safeway, Duracell, I talk about Dollar General later on. We talk about several billion dollars that are going back to the management, institutional investors, and KKR. So we see that private equity increased a lot dramatically in the last few years until the crisis. 2007, we have about 120, 130 funds that raise about $180 billion of equity. Add to that the, the debt that we're talking about a lot of transactions. We talk about $440 billion of transaction in 2006, 2007, and this is about 2% 2, 2 of the GDP, and not of the GDP of the, of the market capitalization. They also were involved in a lot of M&A, 25% of the M&A transaction, about a third of the, all the IPO transaction, big players. Why is that? Uh, first of all, they pay very little taxes on the carried interest, on the profits for the selling the companies, the private companies, they're paying only 15% taxes as compared to ordinary tax rates of 35%. They were able until the crisis to get a lot of high yield debt for really low prices, for 8% without any covenants, etc. And there was, a con uh, and there was the Sarbanes-Oxley effect. A lot of people claim that because of Sarbanes-Oxley, companies prefer to go private uh, to prevent going filing with the SEC, etc. I don't buy this claim because we also see a lot of private equity transactions in Europe, in Japan, places that are not necessarily subject to something similar to Sarbanes-Oxley. And where I add a little to this literature as well is uh, I find a great willingness on the part of the management team to take their own company private via management buyer transaction and leverage buyer transaction. I'll talk about it later. What do private equity add to the, to, to the table? Financial engineering, they take a lot of leverage, discipline, they need to pay interest on time, they cannot uh, spend it on private jets. Another part of it is that they take a debt tax shield, they need to pay, the interest expense is uh, reducing the income, they're paying less taxes to the IRS. Governance and engineering, they put very strong board of directors, they're monitoring the CEO very closely. We, we document that a third of the CEOs of private equity are, are uh, laid off within the first 100 days, the total of two thirds within the first two years. And they tie the performance to compensation very well. The other part, operational engineering, great operational engineering, the best CEO, the best consulting firms to come with the best operations. They're doing a great job on that. Uh, another element that I'm talking about is that they are very efficient in tax avoidance, in tax planning, on the verge of aggressiveness in tax planning that can increase the bottom line margins. So this is what I will start to talk about. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, in the literature when practitioners saying, okay, if private equity can do it, why anyone else cannot do it? Everyone can raise more leverage, put better board of directors, put better management team in place and run the company better, and also do the tax avoidance as well. So there are two answers for that. One answer is very intuitive, not very academic, is that everyone can watch Top Chef. Doesn't mean that we will be a Top Chef. <laughs> uh, if you look at, uh, at the chairman of uh, Bain, 
uh, Rit Gadish, she wrote a book about private equity, and she said a lot of companies, first of all, afraid of changes. So they don't want to change the leverage, they don't want to change the operations, and even if they do, they don't do it well enough. They're doing it very well, but the top private equity are doing it perfectly, and this makes the difference. But this is a side. Let's talk a little about efficient tax planning. So why I started to look at that is that the media is picked up of aggressive tax avoidance by private equity sponsors. Uh, the media was quite colorful. Some of it was colorful, uh, comparing private equity to pigs and the like in the avoidance of paying taxes. Uh, more particularly, they were complaining that when Blackstone take itself public, so they were able to reduce taxes, they pay effective tax rate of about 1.4%. If you compare them to Goldman Sachs, they pay about 35%. And they also were complaining that the carried interest, that they're paying only 15% taxes on it, should be taxed as an ordinary income at 34%. And they also were complaining that, uh, that the private equity is able to reduce taxes within the portfolio companies that they own, and this is the focus of, of my research. So in order to do that, I look at a unique sample of private equity firms that have public debt. So these are private firms. They have no stock price, but they have public debt, and therefore I have 10Ks, 10Qs, proxies, and I can dig in and see what exactly they are doing. They are not private firms on the left, which are, don't have a stock price, don't have a debt, and don't have financial at least in the state. And they're not public firms in the sense that they don't, don't have a stock price. So in my research, I, I both compare private to public, but here I will focus on comparing those private firms that are owned by private equity sponsors to those that are owned by management and employees. To give you some flavor, these are the companies that are talking about, some of the companies. Levi's owned by the Haas family, okay? Management owned company. UPS was owned by the employees until 1999, and then they went to IPO. Silly Matrices was owned by several private equity sponsors, including the KKR along the years, Duracell I mentioned before, some examples for firms, so we have enough firms to create research. What I find here, I find that PE-backed firms, firms that are owned by private equity firms, able to save approximately 3 to 4% on taxes relative to similar firms that are owned by management and employees. Okay? I associated it with their sophistication. They have a lot of resources to, to hire the best tax uh, consultants, and they also have the appetite to add value to the company, and by saving taxes, you, you increase the bottom line. It's 3 to 4%. It's really hard to increase margin by 3 to 4% if you have it via taxes. What makes me feel better about the result is that I find that the results are stronger when private equity control the, the, the company via majority control and not a minority control, and also when the company is owned by large private equity, KKR of the world, as opposed to small uh, private equity that might not, uh, might not have the resources and expertise to put it in place. How do they do that? We also hand collect information, uh, mainly about utilizing a low tax foreign operation, a lot of tax credit, and a lot of uh, sales and lease back transactions that reduce a lot of taxes and are considered relatively aggressive via the IRS. So this is what we do on this project, but what I want to focus is actually managerial incentives in financial reporting. What happened to the management team around going private and going public transactions? So, this is a quote that actually I am a loom of this uh, uh, institution as well. I did my PhD here, and my dissertation was quoted in the New Yorker that executives are making a lot of accounting gimmicks before going private or going public transactions. And this is my starting point. So this, this leads me to the, the concept of earnings management. <laughs> so there's a lot of different ways to define earnings management. I just want to remind, refresh your memory about basic accounting. So we in accounting try to capture economics reality. This is what accounting is for. And we give the manager a lot of uh, the management team a lot of discretion to come with the assumptions about depreciation, etc. They buy a machine, they don't know if the machine will survive 10 years, 15 years. Management knows the best. Let's assume that they think that the machine will survive 10 years. They put it in their assumptions and it's affecting depreciation expenses. However, they think that it will survive 10 years, it's actually survived 12 years. This leads to measurement errors. And sometimes they know that it survived 10 years, they think it will, but they say it survived 20 years in order that depreciation expense will go down and net income will go up. So this has led me to incentive to distort. So indeed, we have a lot of people that prevent that from happening. We have a lot of fraud standards, we have auditors, we have the SEC, we have board of directors, a lot of good people standing there to prevent earnings management. Uh, but we find an indication of earnings management, especially when to work, meet, want to meet or beat analyst expectations. This is, for example, a, a trend of companies that are able to meet or beat Analyst expectations, it's reached about 80%. Okay, so this means that the analyst is doing an amazing job or the management team doing some things to, in order to 
reach the analyst expectation. This is one way for us in accounting to capture earnings management. This is a really intuitive way. We have much more sophisticated ways. I like this one because this is just graph you the earnings per share. You see that around zero, you have very few companies. Because if a company has zero earnings per share or very little negative earnings per share, they do some accounting manipulation to move to small positive earnings per share. So the drop here is statistically significant. Of course, if you're losing a lot of money, you take a big buff and you shine next year. If you're doing really well, you might smooth it around. But here is the action of small earnings management can move you from negative to positive. You can put here earnings growth and earnings decline. You can put here analyst expectations. You will find the same thing, even after Southern Soxley. It declined, but it continued. <coughs> this is how they do that. This is companies that have been caught, many by revenue recognition. Okay? It's adding up to more than 60%, more than 100% because the company is doing several of things. Okay, so this is just the background. Going private transaction, management bias. The management team buys its own company. Okay, take it private. For example, HCA, it's a hospital company, did it twice, once in 1989 for 5.1 billion, 2006 for 21 billion. This is a cartoon that the CEO gave the chairman after the second MBO because they have a real cash cow here. And what is happening here, these are the financials just before the MBO transaction. What do you expect the earnings to be? To go up or go down? Any thoughts? Down, okay? And indeed, 14% down in earnings just before the transaction, provision for doubtful, doubtful account, increase in uninsured discounts, all in the discretion of the management, all went full court and it's fine, but still discretion of the management. Aramark, same story, two MBOs, the CEO that is uh, not a founder, but was in the company uh, for 20 years after the second MBO is worth about $1 billion. The same thing, 14% decline in continue, uh, income from continuing operations just before the transaction, impairment of goodwill, etc. So managers on one hand need to be there for the shareholders and get the fair price for the shareholders, okay? On the other hand, they buy their own company so you expect them to want to buy it for as cheap as possible. I look at 70 companies that did MBOs, all of them, okay? All of them have earnings management, not necessarily earnings management downward, but declining earnings just before the transaction. Those that have more declining earnings are those with a lot of asset in place. And this makes sense because you need to go to the bank and get a lot of leverage. And if you tell them that you're not doing well, you might not get the leverage. So, and how to do that? Deferring recognition of revenues, okay? So this is the easy case. Let's look at leverage by a transaction. You sell your company to a third party, okay? KKR bought Dollar General. Your Dollar General, will you manage earnings upward or downward? Probably upward because you want to get a better price. You want to keep the management team in place. You know that private equity look at the financials. So this is what you expect to see. Dollar General is, think about Walmart, but just much more cheaper, okay? Selling everything for one dollar, most of it for one dollar. Dollar General is the leader in this, uh, in this uh, industry. They have about 8,000 stores, now they have even more. Went to IPO in 68. 2007, KKR took them private. Great stock premium, generous enterprise <coughs> value to multiple to EBITDA. Some termination fees, I will talk about it in a second. Uh, this is just to look at the comparable companies. They got uh, 11 multiple versus the nine comparable company, 31 premium on stock versus 21. This is the financial just before. We expect upward earnings management. But what we see is 61% drop in net income just before the transaction. The change strategy, massive markdown of inventory, renovation of stores, big decline in earnings. Uh, so by the way, so the premium doesn't look so great because the price already declined to $14 just before they got the 30%. So the 30% premium just gave, got them back to where they were. And also if you look at the multiples, it was at least the trailing multiple was over depressed EBITDA, so the multiple look really high. So we need to be careful with that. But what is more interesting, the CEO that was with the company only for four years, and before that ran a company out of bankruptcy and to bankruptcy again, was able to get out of the transaction $30 million, okay? And he left the company, okay? So we see indication that the courts overall become more skeptical about this kind of transaction. HCA, the termination fees was 500 million and the court reduced it to only $220 million. Lear, they got actually a stock offer of 80% premium over the stock price. The board approved it, but the, the court blocked it 
because uh, the CEO was going to get out $12 million in retirement that otherwise he would not be able to get. Tops, top, the Tops management had several offers from several private equity, but they neglected to tell the shareholders that the, the offer that they want is the offer that keeps them in place. And what it went through eventually, SSNC, SSNC, yeah, they actually, the shareholders approved the transaction already, they just block it because they said if the executive gets $72 million, he might have a conflict of interest. The transaction went through, they're going to go public again soon. So we expect the target firms will try to increase earnings, okay, to do earnings management upward in order to get a better price. But saying that, if the CEO has a golden parachute and he gets a lot of money on the way, it might be the case of Dollar General, or if, there is a, if the CEO can stay with the company and get the upside if the company is doing well, we expect maybe to have up a downward earnings management. And this is exactly what I find. I find overall upward earnings management before LBO transaction, but downward earnings management um, if the CEO stay with the company. So to summarize it, uh, before MBO, buy cheap, downward earnings management. Before LBO, you want to sell high, upward earnings management. But if the CEO stay with the company, I find indication that it's like MBO and it's downward earnings management. I'm out of time, so I'll not share with you the going public transaction. But thank you so much.